Hello and welcome back to Movie Massacre. I'm joined today by legendary horror host himself, John Stanley. How are you? Well, you told me we were going to do this interview off the cuff, but isn't this a little ridiculous? No, you'll see what I do with you later. Well, I assume I'm on the cutting edge of a horror hosting right now with that knife you had. Yes, don't mind the uh, blood on it. Does this mean I might end up on the cutting room floor? We'll see how the interview goes. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I wanted to talk to you a little bit tonight about you. A little bit? A little, a little bit right now, at least. A little bit about John Stanley. <laughs> may not last very long, but go ahead and try. <laughs> yes, we'll see. Uh, hopefully I won't accidentally push a button and electrocute you too early. Shocking. <laughs> John. Yes. Creature Features. John Stanley himself is on my set. Wow, I'm blown I'm away. Right up. <laughs> oh, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be here, Miss Misery. Thank what would, you. What would you like to know first? Well, first I'd like to know, are those too tight? No, they feel fairly loose. I'm, I can live with it. Okay, good. Well, I'll tighten those later then. <laughs> John, Creature Features. How, how long did you host Creature Features for? Well, Creature Features was on the air for 14 years. Bob Wilkins, my predecessor, did it for eight. And I did it for six, so it, it's still one of the most popular Bay Area television shows, uh, despite all the years that have intervened. I find that to be amazing, that people still remember it. I'm still invited into public places. Can you imagine that? You in public places? Wow. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> now, you also do writing. You worked for Chronicle for a while. Yeah, for 33 years. It started out as a copy boy, and because of my love for movies, I grew up uh, from the time I was six. My father and I would go to the movies all the time. My, my dream was to work uh, as an entertainment writer, so one of the first people I sought out at the Chronicle just to get to know him was the movie critic, <laughs> Payne Knickerbocker. What a wonderful name for a movie critic. And uh, because of that relationship, after less than a year at the uh, paper, uh, I was given the opportunity to write some film reviews. And from that, I uh, was able to spin out and uh, become an, uh, became a news reporter for a while on the This World magazine, which uh, came out every Sunday. Uh, and it was uh, once described as a condensed version of Time magazine with just the highlights of the week, uh, international, national, and local. Um, well, inserted inside this world was the Sunday date book or the pink section of the Chronicle, which started out uh, as a 16-page uh, pullout. It was purposely put on pink paper so people could find it, pull it out. You'd have the TV schedule for the week as well as what's at the movies and so on. And there would be a few pages of stories devoted to what was uh, about to happen in the entertainment world. Well, the two sections together put me in the pro right proximity, and uh, within a couple of years, I was devoting most of my time not so much to writing the news magazine as writing exclusive interview stories for the pink section. Uh, movies, television, nightclubs, uh, the topless movement was afresh at that time. I should say abreast. <laughs> of what was going on in our uh, the sexual revolution of the early 60s. So it was in a very exciting time when the Chronicle was in, the, was in a process of growing. The uh, pink sections really started about two years before I got there as a, as a pullout by itself. So it was fairly new, and uh, there was an opportunity to work for it, to help to develop it. Uh, pretty soon, instead of... Uh, a staff of two, we had a staff of three, four, and over the years the staff would keep keep growing and growing. And uh, somewhere along the way I met Mr. Bob Wilkins, who was the host of Creature Features. Uh, in those days we only had about 
three major television stations, uh, networks, I should say, and a few independent channels. So if you sat down on Saturday night to watch TV, you might have as many as six stations. Wow. And it just so happened that the Sacramento station where Bob started was carried in our area. We lived out in Pacifica, out on the coast side of uh, 20 miles south of downtown San Francisco. Uh, and so I started watching Bob Wilkins, and we became good friends. Not that we ever met, but uh, we contacted each other by phone and by letter. There are many letters that have survived that exchange. And when Bob was moved from Channel 3 in Oakland, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Sacramento, to Oakland, Channel 2, Jack London Square, uh, I was the very first uh, media representative to interview him. And so a huge a story appeared in the pink section on the, on the Sunday before the very first Creature Feature show. And uh, Bob uh, told the story that on Monday morning, when he went to work, uh, everyone was truly amazed that someone that nobody had ever heard of in the Bay Area before Bob Wilkins had been given so much space in the pink section of the Chronicle. And uh, Bob just winked and said, well, it's the people you know, that's what's important. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that established our relationship, and Bob invited me to be a guest on his show quite, fr quite frequently, maybe three or four times a year. Uh, at that time, I was making short subject 16-millimeter uh, uh, story films, and one night <clears throat> uh, he presented one of my films. It was called Homecoming, a Fable, about a man who comes home from work to discover his wife and uh, son are missing. He can't find him in the house, and he goes searching through the home, and finally uh, he discovers their silhouettes are etched on a wall. And uh, what exactly happened? Well, that's kind of left up in the air, but it has a UFO disappearance abducted by aliens kind of quality to it. And uh, then Bob would have me on the show as a uh, expert, film expert. Uh, we would talk about new movies that were opening, the film that would be on that evening, you know, that evening show. And so, in 1978, Bob uh, announced his retirement to privately to the people at the station. Uh, you have to remember that Bob was doing not only creature features uh, on, sa on Friday and Saturday nights, but he had uh, Captain Cosmic, a character he played Monday through Friday. Plus he had a show, a similar creature feature show on Channel 40 in Sacramento. Uh, and he had his own business. He uh, ran an advertising agency. And remember Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Parlor? Uh, they're still around. I see mm -hmm. there are some. That was his major, major account. Oh. So he was doing publicity and advertising for Chuck E. Cheese. Wow. Well, he just reached a point of ex exhaustion. So Judith Morgan Jennings, who was the uh, PR director for Channel 2, called me. At one evening at work to say that Bob had announced his resignation. So I immediately called Bob at home. He lived in Oakland. Uh, solely thinking, oh, there must be a story in this. This will be an important story for the mm -hmm. uh, pink section. And I got Bob. He answered the phone. <clears throat> and he says, John, why are you calling me? And I says, well, I thought I'd get the details for a story. Oh, I thought you were calling me because you wanted the job. <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I really hadn't. And he says, the next thing he said was, I think you should have that job. Uh, I tried to argue him out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I have had no experience as a TV host. I was a journalist. I was a writer. Uh, however, uh, he insisted that I have a lunch with a couple of the executives from Channel 2. He at least wanted me to meet them and, you know, uh, voice my opinion about the show and maybe something might happen down the road. So I went and had uh, lunch with uh, Ray Jacobs and, ch and uh, Tom Breen. Tom Breen was the program manager, and he's the one who had originally bought, uh, brought Bob Wilkins to Channel 2 from Channel 
three in Sacramento, an NBC affiliate station, because he felt that he liked Bob's presentation, it was tongue in cheek, and he thought that if they put Bob into prime time at nine o'clock instead of late evening, that Bob would have a fighting chance in the ratings, and they were absolutely right. Bob was one of the highest rated shows for a nine o'clock time slot wow. up against NBC Saturday Night at the Movies and other network programming. So, <clears throat> uh, so there was Tom Breen, the genius behind Creature Features. So I decided, well, I'll have a little fun here. I'll try to impress them <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so I did my very best to make make me look better than I perhaps was as far as becoming a television celebrity is, would be concerned at the time. And uh, I was so shocked because at the end of the lunch, they said, well, we want you to come down to the station and do an audition. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd gotten past the initial barriers, and now I, I went home to my wife, Erica, and I said, honey, I don't have a clue. What, I, what am I going to do? I have to do an audition. <laughs> Well, um, I had a, a friend at the Chronicle, Ken Davis. Uh, Ken was an artist and a photo retoucher, and we had written um, uh, we had written a couple of books together. We had made a motion picture called Nightmare in Blood, which was about a horror host, uh, in part, who goes to a convention of a horror convention uh, at the um, at a theater in Oakland, California, at the old uh, Fox Theater on Telegraph Avenue. We actually rented the theater to make the film. And the film had uh, been distributed, had done pretty well. And uh, so I thought, maybe Ken and I'll go out and I'll shoot some footage of me as a horror host around San Francisco. <laughs> I know, we can sit and laugh at this. <laughs> and I also did a scene where I'm carrying several film cans, uh, 16 millimeter film mm -hmm. cans and I'm running down the street and all of a sudden I'm standing in front of channel 2 the front door <laughs> and I'm trying to open the door and I'm drop I drop a film can and I'm a clumsy fool you know but I'm the host I'm rushing to go into the station to be the mm -hmm. host and so we edited together a number of little comedy things mm -hmm. I went down to theaters and Market Street and things like that so uh, <laughs> A one, and so Bob ha was having me come down to the station um, uh, to just, he wanted to show me how the show was done, technically, uh, from the point of view of being in the control room, so I could get an idea of the director and those kind of things. And uh, I think it was on, uh, just before Christmas of 1978, uh, I went down to Channel 2 and I did the, <laughs> I did the, I did the audition, and I turned to my wife at the end of it, and I said, honey, pack everything up. Let's go home. I'm going to get drunk. Uh, <laughs> this was a total disaster today. Oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, we had, as part of the audition, we had played uh, the little introduction I had made. I put some music behind it and, and so on. And so a couple of weeks went by, and on Christmas Eve, Miss Misery, isn't this amazing? On Christmas Eve... The phone rings, and it's Judith Morgan Jennings, who's gone to the Channel 2 party, mm -hmm. Christmas party, and she overheard Tom Breen and somebody else talking, and uh, she had learned secretly, nobody else knew, that I had been picked to replace Bob Wilkins. Well, I fell off my bar stool that <laughs> evening wow. and hit the floor with a dull thud. I was quite amazed. Uh, because I had had no experience. Um, anyway, uh, went down, was working with Bob, and uh, he was showing me the rope. He was very good about it. You know, I, think, I guess he was very pleased that, that I had uh, been chosen out of all the people who had come down. A lot of people auditioned. You can imagine word got out. Uh, some real strong professional people from the Bay Area, from radio and television, were... Uh, all, you know, vying for the position, charging through the front door. <laughs> so there I was, this innocent, huh, kind <laughs> of a guy. And Bob was very kind to me. Uh, and uh, said, okay, John, next week you're going to do your first show. It's good, and I'm going to step down, and it's going to be all yours. Wow. So that's how it all started. 
So you can imagine I was in a state of shock, semi-shock. How in the hell am I going to pull this off? Well, Miss Misery, uh, the fact that I was a newspaper man really helped out. I had a lot of contacts okay. at the local television stations. I knew uh, the publicists at the TV networks. I knew people, the right people to call, and I thought, well, maybe I can uh, make some connections here and bring some really top-notch people onto the show. The Bay Area is full of wonderful writers, science fiction, mm -hmm. mystery writers. Uh, they're always putting on wonderful plays and productions of various kind, local or the uh, mm -hmm. you know roadshow plays. And I thought, uh, combine that with the writers of nonfiction, UFO abductions. Uh, maybe I can, you know, keep the show going. So each week I tried to um, have as many colorful guests as I could. And I um, thought you would like to know this little side story. I knew the people at Disney, the Walt Disney Studios, and they found out that I taped on Fridays. So <laughs> all of a sudden, every time there was a new Walt Disney movie opening nationally, mm -hmm. uh, they would conveniently bring the star of that movie to San Francisco on Friday morning. <laughs> they would fly him up on Friday morning, pick him up at the airport and immediately bring him over to Channel 2 where they would uh, there I would be ready to f to tape a segment with that particular guest. And then uh, here's the part you might really like. Then uh, when the show was over and it was time to go home, no, we wouldn't go home. We would go down to Ernie's restaurant in North Beach, San Francisco's leading restaurant at the time and do a, a set-down dinner interview with that same personality, only now I was wearing my reporter cap, <laughs> and I would do an interview taking copious notes for the Chronicle. Wow. So I would achieve, they would, Walt Disney would achieve double mm -hmm. from one person than they normally would. Television and journalism <laughs> together. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, awesome. And, and so a lot of other movie companies heard about this, and they would occasionally bring... Uh, somebody somebody mm -hmm. in and um, a George Takei of Star Trek mm -hmm. uh, I had met him a couple of times as a journalist before uh, Creature Features and he knew the show was taped on Fridays so sometime during the week usually Monday or Tuesday the phone at the Chronicle would ring and it would be George saying hello John I'm coming up to the Bay Area on Friday <laughs> Oh, really? Isn't that a coincidence? That's when I, I'm doing the show. Mm -hmm. So uh, several times, George would conveniently be there to be a guest on the show. <laughs> what better guest than someone from the original Star, uh, Star Trek cast? You know, And so it went. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the funniest moments was Edie Williams. Uh, she was primarily a, st uh, a star of R-rated uh, or films that leaned heavily with sexual themes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was actually appearing at the Mitchell Brothers Theater. Now, <laughs> this getting a little racy here. <laughs> I, I think she was doing some lap dances or whatever. <laughs> Having never been to the Mitchell Brothers Theater, I can't... Anyway, uh, she ended up as a guest. And so she was driven in a limousine uh, by the Mitchell brothers over to the station <laughs> and she's wow. dressed she's dressed uh, in a pair of slacks pan uh, hair isn't fixed or anything looks you know mm -hmm. nothing special and she walks in I'm not, I'm not the first one to see her my wife is because she's <laughs> Erica's working as my producer while <laughs> oh, I'm man. running around getting ready and she's helping out uh, Edie's very angry because the, the driver of the limousine made a play for her, a sexual play for her. So she's all upset, and she really doesn't want to do the show. And well, I had my script when I met her, and I said, I'm listening to her, and I'm looking at her. She's not dressed for the part. I said, well, Edie, um, uh, I hope you stay to do the show because I wrote some special material for you. And all of a sudden, her attitude totally changed. She suddenly... What? You wrote what, what, what material? And I said, well, I'm going to have a segment where uh, I had a chair, not unlike yours, with the skulls <laughs> on the top. I said, I'm going to have you sitting in the chair, uh, and I've got some copy for you. It'll be on a uh, t 
teleprompter and you can play a kind of sexual creature kind of thing however you want to do it it's written to be very sexual oh let me see it she reads it oh i'd love to do <laughs> here she was going to leave you know yeah so she runs over and she got there kind of late so she hurries gets dressed uh behind a screen she doesn't even go to the green room uh she gets a little she's got a little bag she's carrying she runs behind the screen and a few minutes later she steps out wearing this short skirt high heels she's got her hair all puffed up you know <laughs> and, and with a low-cut blouse and she's the sex uh, object you know mm -hmm. suddenly so she sits in the chair and she does this little thing I'd written for her and I have to tell you a copy of that was made and sent around to all of the advert to all of the workers up in the advertising department and that became the talk of channel two was Edie Williams <laughs> in the creature feature chair and she's uh, just doing all of these things you know <laughs> and she stayed and we did this wonderful interview with her uh, I used to uh, uh, I used to ha try to have fun with the uh, the sex symbols of our Mm -hmm. of our culture at that time. Mm -hmm. I, Creature Features, a tongue-in-cheek show, you know. Don't take this too seriously. <laughs> anyway, wow. it became it became a highlight of, of the show, Edie Williams. <laughs> oh, that's great. I don't great. think I've told that story before. It's, oh, uh, really? I think you're oh. the first one, Miss Misery, to hear it. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. We will be back with John Stanley after this clip. Creature features. The demon await. Hey, who is this? The keeper of the demon. So what? I challenge you to face the terror of the demon. Terror is strictly for Saturday night. Then you refuse the demon's challenge? Are you kidding? I've never turned down a challenge in my entire life. Good. Then you'll be outside Channel 2 tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. A black limousine will pick you up. You will be blindfolded. You will ask no questions. Just tell the driver to be on time. I like people who are prompt. The demon will be prompt more than you can imagine. <laughs> I'm Art Larson, and I've been appointed by the demon to welcome you. Welcome me? Hey, where am I? Hey, you'll find out soon enough. Hey, Larson, you don't scare me with your so-called demon. You don't fool us, Stanley, with your false bravado. Hey, Larson, you want to know how I feel? Steady, like a rock. Stanley, I'll tell you how you feel. You're nothing more than a mass of quivering jello. Listen, Stanley, before this day is done, you're going to be wishing you weren't in such a hurry. Take him. The demon awaits. Who's there? I'm Dave Simpson, Keeper of the Demon. 
This is your last chance to change your mind, Stanley. You can still back down. And disappoint my Creature Features audience? I'd rather jump into a pit of cobras, Simpson. A pit of cobras would be preferable. Listen, if you've got something to dish out, go on and dish it out because I can take it. So can my audience. They love this horror stuff. You've just stepped beyond the point of no return. Hey, wait a minute. I know where I am. <laughs> this is Great America. Marriott's Great America in Santa Clara. Have a pleasant ride, Stanley. <laughs> the voice of John Stanley. I'm still in the clutches of the demon, but he has given me permission to tell you one final time that you can still win a free demon kit or a free pass to Marriott's Great America in Santa Clara by simply writing to him in care of the Demon Strikes Back, Creature Features, number one Jack London Square, Oakland 94607. And if you're one of the lucky winners, perhaps you'll be joining me. Uh, All right, John, how you doing now? Well, actually, there's something I forgot to tell you, Miss Misery. You see, I'm an escape artist. <laughs> oh. You know, when you were holding that knife, uh, that part of the knife against my throat, mm -hmm. I was starting to feel like Al Gore. A certain wave of warmth came over me. Well, I'm going to have to send Mr. Torture up here to tighten those shackles now on you. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to send him up here to do something because I'm a free man. 
We'll see. My doors are locked, so you're not going anywhere. I may have the key. Oh. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out after you tell us a little bit about I was a TV horror host. Well, uh, it's hard to remember sometimes where an idea first originates from. But uh, one day, I got to thinking that I had interviewed all of these celebrities during the Creature Feature years, such as Vincent Price, Christopher Lee, Ray Bradbury, Robert Block, uh, the entire cast of Star Trek, uh, Leonard Nimoy, William Shatner, and all the others. Um, Ray Harryhausen, uh, when Clash of the Titans opened, and I thought it would be wonderful perhaps to take those and put them into, uh, in, into a book, but the book needed a framework, and I thought, well, I was a TV horror host for six years. Uh, I'll make it my autobiography, as it were, and uh, by um, starting out with the history of horror hosting on radio, because that's really where the ideas for the horror hosts of television uh, originated, um, because in the days of radio, we had the mysterious traveler, we had uh, inner sanctum mysteries with the creaking door and the weird guy who invites you to come into the crypt and all of those others. Oh, and the witch's tale, Nancy, the old witch of Salem and Satan, her wise black cat. And they stare into the embers of the fireplace and soon an image starts to come out, rise out. And I thought uh, those are really colorful characters and they really were the basis for the horror hosts of the television era starting with Vampira, mm -hmm. uh, who took uh, a little bit from the Adams family, I believe, mm -hmm. was inspired a little bit. So there's a lot of uh, media that gets wound into this, a lot of our past culture. And then the history of Bob Wilkins and my history uh, doing the show is as amusing and tongue-in-cheek as I could make it. And uh, decided at some point this should be a pictorial. So I believe there's 250... Photographs, I don't even remember. I don't, no, there's 556 uh, photographs in this book. Wow. Uh, of myself, Bob Wilkins, the stars I write about. Um, also, there's a section on um, real life mystery uh, uh, involving ghosts. There were a couple of times um, I remember going to the slaughterhouse. It's the oldest home in Oakland, it has a history of being haunted. And uh, going there and meeting uh, Mr. Slaughter, that's why they called it the Slaughterhouse, and uh, doing a, a segment. I didn't feel anything weird, but my wife Erica looked into the eyes of the dog. The man had a small dog there and uh, felt that the dog had conveyed a message to her that this was a bad place to be. You better get out of here. It's funny how she felt that because... Uh, she's not one that normally has strange experiences and we went home it was a Friday night and she slept for the entire next two days she didn't get up until Monday morning and uh, she just slept that whole time I couldn't get her to come get out of bed nothing wrong with her she just wanted to sleep um, and there were some other stories like that so uh, that's another part of the book uh, true life weird events that mm -hmm. it, that happened to us. Are there any guests that you have never gotten a chance to interview that you wanted to? Oh, one could make a list that would go on forever. Um, the one interview I almost lost, did get it, was Christopher Lee. Um, mm. Christopher Lee arrived at the studio a little late, and I had uh, designed a couple of segments to do for the show, that show that for that Sunday, I mean Saturday night. And he walked in, and, and what was happening, Miss Misery, Channel 2 was building me a new set. Oh. I was using the old Bob Wilkins set. Mm -hmm. This was toward the end of my first year. And so there was a group of um, a Star Trek fan club. The uh, members came in costumes from Star Trek. And they had been down to visit the show a couple of times. So I came up with the idea that I would have them as a guest on the show as if they were building my set so that they would be carrying saws and hammers and pieces of wood <coughs> and they would be walking around the set. Well, that's what 
Christopher Lee walked in. He came in late. And I'm going to sneeze. I'm sorry. Oh, that that's okay. I sneeze all the time. <coughs> and everybody, this is John Stanley sneezing. Oh, Isn't that great? Sorry. It's the first time it's ever been recorded on film. So... <laughs> You have an exclusive, Miss Misery. I I've do. Never done that before. Now I'm going to eBay that napkin. <laughs> anyway, um, so he, we had all of these characters, and I had a soundtrack of hammers and saws and skill saws making noises, as if there's a lot of activity. And I guess because he had arrived late, I hadn't had a chance to explain to Christopher Lee what was going on. And I guess he looked at it and decided this wasn't for him, and he started to walk out the door, but he stopped. There was a TV uh, set above the door. Pardon me. And it was Ray Bradbury I had just introduced. I was in my chair introducing the segment. And it was Ray Bradbury, whom he knew. So he stopped to watch a, about a five-minute interview with Ray Bradbury. And uh, the lights came on. I had finished the segment. And he turned to my wife and said, Well, if it's good enough for Ray Bradbury, I guess it's good enough for me. And he stayed, and we did the interviews, and everything worked out fine. But I came within an inch. Had he walked out that door a moment earlier, mm -hmm. I would have lost him. We'll be back wow. with John Stanley after these clips. Oh, you scared the phantasm right out of me. Hey, I know you. You're Rangus Scrim. You play the tall man in the new film, Phantasm. They tell me you're very gregarious and outgoing and friendly and charming and talkative and chatty. What's the idea of bringing me out here to Morningside Mortuary like this? Say, who are you anyway? I'm Don Coscarelli. I'm the writer and director of Phantasm. We just thought we'd get you in the right mood for the picture so you could take it back to your Creature Features audience and tell them all about it. Didn't we, Angus? I don't want to entertain you in a setting in which I feel most at home. I promise you every comfort. Well, you certainly believe in atmosphere and realistic settings. This graveyard is just like a scene out of Phantasm. Where did you get the inspiration, Don, to make such a terrifying film? Well, as a matter of fact, I've always loved graveyards and I've always loved horror pictures. In fact, we have a Creature Features type show down in Los Angeles that I always used to watch when I was a young boy. It used to scare the heck out of me. At any rate, I always wanted to make a horror film and Phantasm was it. The film is certainly unrelenting. Horror after horror, like a nightmare. Would you say that it's representative of your own personal nightmares, Don? I think it definitely does. In fact, one of the best scenes in the picture is about a little weapon that, that the tall man uses in his mausoleum. It's called the, We call it the silver sphere. What it does is it flies around through the hallways, and any intruder, it seeks them out and kills them. By That's the ball that has the knife on it? Yes, it sticks into their head, bores into their brain, and sucks all their blood out of their head. Don, you've made two previous films, neither of which had a horror film theme to it. What made you decide to do a horror film on your third time out as a producer-director? Well, horror pictures have always had a good box office, and that's why I initially wanted to do a horror picture. But the great thing about a horror picture is you can get an audience to scream. And Angus and I go to the screenings now, the sneaks of it, and we stand in the back, and people jump and they scream, and we know where all the screams are, and we find ourselves jumping, and it's just great fun. Now, some of Phantasm is very gory. Do you feel this is essential to a, to a horror film? Well, or? not necessarily essential, but it's a big part of it. I mean, people, when they come, you have to be realistic in your violence and use of violence. And, uh, well, what we just decided to do was to, to use lots of gore. We use lots of blood. We use red blood, and we also use yellow blood. <laughs> Angus Scrim, how would you, in your own unforgettable words, describe Phantasm? It's about some of the most lovable characters you'd ever want to meet. There's a lady in Lavender who lures her lovers out to the cemetery and then plunges a butcher knife into them. 
It's very convenient for me because it saves me the trouble of going out to gather up the last remains. There's a driver of an ice cream truck who carries pieces of dead bodies in his freezing department. We call them corpsicles. Well, then there's a, a little demon who lives in people's hair and drills into their brains, and there's a caretaker who has his fingers chopped off that then go wandering about the countryside choking people. That's our crowd, and I'm proud to say that not one of them has ever done anything that wasn't thoroughly depraved. Okay, John, I think you got all the information you need to take it back to your Creature Features audience and tell them about Phantasm. Driver, stop here, please. I hope you have a most entertaining afternoon at Morningside Cemetery. I'm still sitting here with John Stanley of Creature Features. That's right, and I'm holding up his newest book, The Gang That Shut Up Hollywood. Gee, I'm so glad you finally did that. I've been waiting for that. Because oh. books are hard to sell these That's days. True. You've got to get them out into the marketplace. Yeah. And there's this war going on with the ebook. Oh, really? The paper book, the old fashioned paper book versus the ebook. Would you believe over 3,200 people have downloaded that as an ebook? Far more than I've been able to sell. I've sold about 1,200 copies, paper. So uh, wow. it's, it's a new crazy world out there. But this book came about uh, <clears throat> because for years I've been looking at my scrapbooks from the Chronicle days. I kept a copy of every story I had written and there were an estimated 800 celebrities I had covered in the world of movies and television. And one night I was reading an old Clint Eastwood story. Uh, the day he shot the Scorpio killer when he was making Dirty Harry. And I thought, wow, that might be uh, the beginnings of a book that where I could put together some of the action icons, some of the major stars such as uh, Clint Eastwood, Chuck Norris, uh, Lauren Bacall, Carl Malden, uh, Robert Mitchum, uh, James Stewart who's on the cover there. I thought if I could collectively bring these together into one format, maybe I'd have something uh, special. Mm -hmm. And like with the Horror Host book, I thought I'll bring in as many photographs as I can. A lot of them were signed by the celebrities. Um, <clears throat> I also found a couple of artists who did some original caricatures and sketches for me for the book. Mm -hmm. So it finally all came together in what I hope, uh, you know, is a very readable a uh, fun experience to meet all of these celebrities kind of in an offhand friendly fashion you know mm -hmm. is there another book in the works yeah uh, there's one that's called the gang that yacked up Hollywood <laughs> uh, that would be the comedians that I met along the way uh, starting with Jack Benny from radio and television uh, there was also Rodney Dangerfield there was Milton Berle Sid Caesar uh, Shelley Berman, some of the top comedians of the time, and so many others too, that uh, you know they've come and gone over the over the decades. But I thought it would be fun to uh, accumulate all of the comedians and try to show you the serious side of life mm -hmm. for the comedians. That's um, that's great. I love it. Is there is there anything you've been ra wanting to write that you haven't written yet, book wise? I mean, is there anything else you might want to do? Yeah, I, I uh, have thought about the, the Creature Feature book we were looking at a little while ago. Mm -hmm. That was quite popular, and I've been thinking um, there were enough leftovers. Uh, there were so many of the horror and sci-fi stars mm -hmm. who came and went uh, that I never had a chance to get into the first book. And there's an, there are enough leftover. I wouldn't call them leftovers, but I mean, mm -hmm. I think I could take those into a second a follow-up book to the original book mm -hmm. and so I'm kind of hoping maybe down the road that might be possible I yeah. also had an offer in Miss Misery uh, for a book I did on Humphrey Bogart uh, it was a novel not not a uh, nonfiction it was published by Dell back in 1980 it's entitled Bogart 48 mm -hmm. where Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre who were friends in real life uh, team up to track down and solve a murder, track down a murderer and solve, and in, in the process, um, 
they were involved in the Academy Awards of 1948. Someone might be setting a bomb off at the Shrine Auditorium. So it's, uh, it's a mixture of real life characters mm -hmm. such as Harry Cohn, uh, Marilyn Monroe and others. Uh, and I've had an offer from a small publisher to bring that book back. Uh, and that's a possibility down the road too. Nice, I like it. Well, but I hope that I can continue uh, through shows such as yours to help and do what I can to keep the old franchise of Creature Features alive, just as you do each week in your own special way. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. More with John Stanley right after these clips. It was just one of those average nights on the Creature Features set. Quiet and uneventful, or so I thought. I'm used to packages. I receive several every week from fans. So I thought nothing of it. It was to be the biggest mistake of my life. I think we overdid it with the knockout gas. Our little gift proved to be wearisome for Mr. Stanley. It serves him right the way he puts people to sleep. Are you sure he's out? Yes, I'm certain. In a few moments, his fans at Creature Features can expect a brand new host. <laughs> ah, are you going to remove all his semi vital organs? No, most of them are probably inferior. All I want is the heart. I didn't know he had one. What a pity we can't sell all the other organs. There is a client in Millbury who's willing to spend $250,000 with a matching blood type for the heart. Well, yes. What? <laughs> That's just the heart. Now imagine. Gesundheit. Dankeschön. Imagine if we could sell the rest of the parts. The lungs. The spleen. The kidneys. The spine. The livers. The lungs. The knees. The kneecaps. Yes, the football players. <laughs> or Tori and the <laughs> Well, think of all the gallbladders we've removed. If we could have sold all of them, we'd be millionaires. You fool, you. Well. You know, it's ironic. Our client in Millbury told me that he's a fan of Stanley's. Yeah? He says he watches Creature Features because <laughs> the show has no heart. Learn to relax, Stanley. It's bad for your blood pressure. It could even kill you. Yeah, but these two nuts were trying to cut out my heart. Can you blame them? They've seen your show. Wait a minute. Who are you anyway? I'm Richard Helsberg, producer of Cardiac Arrest, a new movie. Movie? You mean this whole thing was a setup? And this is Gary Goodrow, the lead, and Nancy Fish. Hi. The most important other character. Hi, John. It's a terrifying movie about a black market in hearts. John, we wanted you to experience firsthand what it's like to be victimized by a body organ racket. We wanted you to feel the cold touch of fear, awaiting death. Open wide. 
we wanted you to be overwhelmingly terrified so that every nerve in your body would cry out and tingle. And your soul would jump out of your skin. We want you to take the word back to your fans that cardiac arrest is a unique cinematic experience. Yes, you see, John, viewers should experience the same jolt you just did. And feel the terror you felt. And see the horrors you saw. Well, now that I'm captive audience, Richard, you may as well fill me in on your new picture. John, we shot it all in San Francisco. We shot it on location, not in any sound studios. And you see, John, I play a San Francisco homicide detective who lives in North Beach, and I'm on the trail of these killers. John, I'm Gary's girlfriend, Tiffany. Uh, I play a meter maid. See, John, we're counting on you, Stanley, just to uh, let the public know what a good film this is, and to let them know how dangerous it is when you start putting a price tag on the human body. One last warning, John. This film is definitely not for the squeamish. Especially for those with weak hearts. Oh, John, just a moment before you leave. We had a little memento that we thought we'd show you. So you can always remember this touching moment. A further warning. Cardiac arrest. Is a motion picture. That is all. I, I don't know how you did this, but I let my guard down for just a moment and I suddenly found my hands entrapped once again. Ah. <laughs> That's right. I'm sneaky like that. Well... I'm just going to have to keep my eye on you a little, with a little more care. Or you could just stay here tonight. <laughs> oh, really? But you'll be tied all night, sorry. Oh, I'll be tied up, yeah, okay. I won't have time for anything else. No, sorry about that. But John, thank you so much for being on the show. Is there a website we can go to and check out more? Well, yes. Uh, we have www.stanleybooks.net where you can uh, find the two books we've talked about, plus some of the DVDs that are currently available. We have our DVD history of Eddie Muller, the film noir expert. Uh, there's John Stanley meets Jack the Ripper. We didn't talk about that one, Miss no, Misery. No, we did. I uh, used to do short mini-movies, uh, uh, pastiches of feature films. Uh, we would get Chuck Norris uh, and other actors to help us do those things. And we brought them together into four hours of uh, creature feature material on two discs. Ooh, so I like it. That's one that the fans might want to look into. Great. Well, John, thank you so much again. It's been great about you talking about creature features and just learning a bunch of history. And I will definitely have you on again if you can escape the chair oh i'm going to be tied up so don't bother <laughs> until next time my little gas and ghouls i'll see you in your nightmares
Yeah.